the first thing that I want to remember is that he was a firm believer that scientific and rational views lay the foundations of modern age. And this is what he wrote, uh, the transformation of all the advanced or rapidly advancing countries has been brought about by the acceptance of a scientific and rational view of life and nature. This is the foundation of modern age. If he did nothing else but founded the Indian Statistical Institute, his name would be etched in the annals of science. It resembled an ancient Gurukul set in silver surroundings, a cocktail of disarming hospitality, famed intellects, and erudite debate amidst a, amidst a context of national importance. So, this is what ISI was, and this is uh, what ISI to a certain extent still remains. Uh, his encounter, Malnobis's encounter with statistics was by chance. Um, he, in 1912, he passed his B.Sc. with honors in physics from the Presidency College, Calcutta, and left for, Eng uh, left for England to study at the King's College in Cambridge. 1915, he completed his tripos, returned home for a short uh, vacation. He was to go back and uh, work with C.T.R. Wilson of Cloud Chamber fame. The war intervened and he never went back. In 1922, he became a professor of physics at the Presidency College and served until 1948. Just before he was uh, going to leave uh, for India in 1915, he had a tutor, Macaulay, in the King's College uh, in Cambridge. And Macaulay uh, drew his attention to Biometrica, uh, the only journal, um, the only professional journal that dealt with quantitative biology which was uh, the foundation of all of modern statistics, even though gambling may be called as the foundation of statistics, but when we talk about statistics, we talk about modern statistics, and uh, essentially modern statistics arose from quantitative biology, or large um, uh, se segments of modern statistics arose from quantitative biology. And this was the paper, this was the journal that uh, used to be published on quantitative biology. It said, a journal for the statistical study of biological problems, and um, it was edited by um, it was edited by uh, Weldon. So when he returned, before he uh, not before, I mean, when he was uh, became a professor of physics or joined the physics department in Presidency College, uh, he because of his uh, understanding of statistics, he set up a statistical laboratory in the Presidency College, and in 1931 moved the uh, statistical laboratory to found the Indian Statistical Institute in Kuala Lumpur um, in 1931. When he joined the Presidency College, uh, Acharya Rajendranath Seal was uh, the professor of uh, professor and head of the Department of Philosophy uh, in Presidency in Calcutta University. And uh, later, uh, Acharya Seal went as vice chancellor to Madras University, but that's uh, much later. At that time, um, Professor Seal was also uh, in charge of the examinations of Calgary University, and he wanted to understand over the years of teaching, and he wanted to calibrate teaching with uh, the performance of the um, of the students, and therefore he uh, wanted to uh, and do this by analyzing the marks that the students were getting in the examination. And so, what he uh, entrusted Marlon Lopez with, uh, he uh, requested him to analyze the marks that were obtained over the years by the various uh, students of various examinations of the Catholic University. His, his goal was to calibrate uh, the uh, performance of the education system within the Catholic University, both in terms of teaching and in terms of learning. <laughs> Later. 
Uh, he said, I cannot see anyone enthusiastic about the poet's repeated appeal for a global union. And as many of you would know, Rabindranath was actually uh, appealing to the world about a global union uh, in various writings and in um, speeches that he delivered in India and outside of India. Uh, I don't know about other matters, but in the matter of unity of reasons, perhaps the poet's ideal will never be established in Vishwabharati in spite of his efforts. Uh, he uh, resigned from Vishwabharati in August of 1929. And uh, Rosinanath, in a letter written on 7th March 1931, again the year um, in its statistical institute was established, reminded uh, the, the readers that to Prashantit on Rob, Robinanath and Vishwabharati are two different entities. By differentiating them, Prashantit on derives great pleasure. He uh, propounded this particular or proposed a uh, formulated uh, uh, measure of distance, uh, which is called d squared. I'm not going to give you formulas, etc., but d squared is now used uh, in, in various domains of science. Uh, from manufacturing to quality control to uh, measurement of uh, physical differences and so on and so forth. While he was doing this, while he was uh, looking at uh, these kinds of things, um, uh, Art Pearson, who uh, you will recall was the editor of Biometrica that introduced statistics to Malanobis, um, Carl Pearson already was thinking about these problems and was trying to measure, um, you know, physical, uh, not physical, uh, conceptual difference between uh, two two races, so to say, uh, and he proposed uh, Carl Pearson had proposed what's called the coefficient of racial likeness. Uh, so how similar were two races based on physical dimensions? Uh, and he looked at various kinds of data, and uh, one of the studies that he did. A collaborator of his or a student of his um, was uh, studying the Burmese skull. Based on skull measurements, they were trying to find out where Burma is placed relative to other kinds of races, etc. And that was published in the Biometrica. And it's in that context that uh, that uh, Pearson um, produced this particular statistic called coefficient of racial likeness. Malanobis was to use this particular coefficient. But he soon realized the shortcomings of, uh, of this uh, coefficient. He said that it's not even measuring the true magnitude of uh, the similarity between these two groups because as you increase the sample size, uh, the statistic changes. And it just keeps changing as you increase the sample size. So this can't be a good measure of uh, similarity or distance between two groups. And that's, that's when he uh, actually formulated uh, got an idea, formulated d squared. I'm not even giving you the formula, but I'm only telling you the context. How Malanobis uh, landed up uh, or uh, propounded uh, the d squared statistic because he was at unease uh, with uh, CRL. He actually sent this paper that was ultimately published in uh, the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal. He actually sent it out to Carl Pearson requesting him to publish in um, Biometrica. It wasn't published, it was sent to Carl Pearson in 1929 for Biometrica, but the paper was not accepted for publication. Ultimately, it was published in uh, the Journal of uh, Asian Society of Bengal and one of the most seminal papers ever, most cited papers ever uh, in, um, in the Journal of the Asian Society is this particular paper. So in India, we have various tribal populations, we have the caste populations. Caste populations are also hierarchically arranged with Brahmins at the top. That's a, that's a social structure, whether we believe it or not. But anyway, one of the things that Majumdar was trying to understand is that can we recapitulate the, the hierarchy of the caste and also find out what the relationship of these caste groups were with the tribal groups um, using uh, certain body dimensions and using certain uh, measures of uh, distance. They uh, selected a large number of groups, arranged in hierarchy, also a large number of groups, uh, tribal groups, and some groups whose positioning was not even known. Not, sociologists were not sure about, about the positioning, social positioning of these groups. So they selected two Brahmin groups, four artisan groups, and eight tribal groups. And uh, there were um, speculations that some groups were, as a, as a result of admixture of some other groups, um, and similarly, the, the, the tribal groups and the artisan groups probably admixed in order to produce a, a, what's now known as a Shagin class group or Jamaat. 
and then there were a large number of other groups uh, whose positioning was not even known. So the manum is for, uh, was to use the d-squared statistics to figure out first whether the uh, sociological interpretations of the hierarchy of these groups stands out with respect to body dimensions, and whether we can uh, discover where these uh, these individuals, these groups, uh, um, uh, were, were positioned in the social hierarchy. Again, like I said, that I'm not going to give you the details of it. Um, what he said, number one, among the groups forming the main sequence, there is a close correspondence between social status and resemblance to dragons. Sankhya was uh, a journal that was founded by uh, uh, P.C. Malanovis in 1933. Uh, the foreword to Sankhya was actually written by Rognath Tagore, uh, the first volume, first volume, first issue. Uh, and, and this became one of the major statistical journals in the world, and it still remains uh, as, as a um, well-known statistical journal globally. So you use, use this distance measure, p squared, and then you would have, when you have multiple groups, you have pairwise distances, so you have a distance matrix. Using this distance matrix, he actually formulated some ways of finding clusters of populations that were more similar to the other clusters. Uh, another interesting feature is that sometimes there is closer resemblance between caste groups within a district than between individuals of the same caste group belonging to different districts. So here is a case where uh, geography plays a more dominant role than so uh, than, than social um, status. Uh, anthropometry alone cannot tell the tale. We have to supplement by other physical, genetic, and serological data. Uh, then it's a, it's a long story after then. The first uh, department of hematology was set up in the Indian Statistical Institute as a result or uh, as a follow up of this particular observation. Uh, later, that hematology unit was to graduate to a human genetics unit, and people like me made a lifetime uh, of a career uh, you know, because of this particular statement. So that, that was uh, model of his data driven inferences. This is not his uh, subject, but then again, uh, this is where he had, uh, he had gone. The, the last part of my uh, discourse on what Malanobis had done in terms of the science, hardcore science, as opposed to policy making, uh, this is uh, probably the last segment that I want to tell you. Uh, large scale sample survey. So, when you have a large population and you want to draw some inferences about the population, uh, usually you don't have the time and uh, money to, uh, to uh, take data from every single unit in the population. This can be a population of schools, can be a population of ants, can be a population of human beings, whatever. Uh, usually, you draw a sample and you draw uh, a representative sample of the population. Uh, gather data from that representative sample and draw inferences about the population. Uh, Manu actually contributed to this. He uh, provided methodologies as to how you should draw a representative sample. How do you test that your representative sample is actually a good sample? He also devised a method of what's called interpenetrating network of subsamples. That, uh, that, that's a method of subsampling which has a built-in method of validation. Oftentimes you discover something and then that because of uh, because of various kinds of nuances, because of lot of variability uh, in the variables that you're looking at, uh, those are the discovery is oftentimes uh, fraught with error. So you need to validate your discoveries, and then you usually draw an independent sample from that same population and see if your uh, discovery will pan out, will validate. But uh, Malnov has actually devised a method by which you don't really need an independent uh, uh, sample in order to validate. It is kind of built in through this interpenetrating system. So uh, we uh, 
wrote uh, something in the encyclopedia about this thing about monoliths, and this is what we concluded: um, innovation, systematization, and concrete applications are the hallmarks of the kind of statistics that is by monoliths. Planning for national development in 1940, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, as the chairman of the National Planning Committee, there was no planning commission at that time. In 1940, it was uh, called the Planning Committee, and uh, Nehru was not yet the prime minister, obviously. Um, uh, and, and he was chairman of the National Planning Committee, and he asked Malanobis to prepare a statistical commentary on the National Planning Committee reports. The National Planning Committee would come up with reports from time to time, uh, and uh, he asked Malanobis to prepare a statistical commentary. In 1949, which of course Malanobis did, as a result, uh, Malanobis was appointed the chairman of the National uh, Income Committee. Malanobis took an unconventional approach to planning that found support in John Robinson. John Robinson, incidentally, was one of the things he advised her. Planning for national Say that this is the total national outlay for all of the sectors combined, and this is what my target will be for the next year. This is where I want to go, where I stand today, and this is where I want to go, and this is my total um, outlay for uh, improvement of the economy. On September 11, uh, 1955, Malanobis went on. Uh, to uh, address uh, uh, in, in the All India Radio and explain the plan strategy to the uh, listeners of, uh, of the radio. And at that time there was no TV, so most everybody was listening to the radio. Malumovis met Paul Neumann in Princeton. He visited Princeton in, in March 1946 and had met Paul uh, Neumann. And of course, uh, uh, von Neumann was then building a computer and a digital computer and so on and so forth. And Malnubis realized that for planning, you have to, uh, you know, gather so much data and to be able to analyze that data and make an impact on planning process, you need to analyze that data rapidly and without a computer, you could not do that. So he realized that it was essential to build up at least one first rate computation and calculating laboratory. This is what he called it in India. Uh, and von Neumann actually promised that von Neumann was building a computer then, and he promised uh, a Manu Nobis. Von Neumann actually asked whether a, a computer could be built in India. Von Neumann assured Manu Nobis that uh, he couldn't assure that it could be built in India, but at least uh, assured Manu Nobis that after he built the first computer, he would actually send uh, one to India. Uh, Manu Nobis soon realized that the costs of acquiring the computer would be uh, enormous, and India could not afford it. To actually buy uh, such a computer. So he established, this is strange why, he established the electronics laboratory and workshop in ISI in 1950. And in 1953, the first analog computer, which is capable of solving a set of simultaneous equations, was actually for, um, uh, you know, invented in India, fabricated in India, and was put to use. This is the last picture of Amalanobis before he passed away. His life can be summed up in this nation. Uh, not armies, not nations have advanced the race. But here and there in the, in the course of ages, an individual has stood up and cast his shadow uh, on the world.